Hello people, in this video let us look at some uh, basic ophthalmology MCQs, okay? Hope you have understood basics of ophthalmology, we'll just be looking at some MCQs. An image seen through the prism is, what are your options? Inverted, tilted, near the base, near the apex. You know the difference between pyramid and prism, right? So this is a prism. So if you look at an image through the prism, how will it be? Let's look at the answer here. Answer is 4, near the apex. So if we say that this is the apex, right, and this is the base, so the image is at the apex, near the apex. So as the prism is bending the light, when you are looking at the image, when you see it through the prism, you will think that it is near the apex, okay. So what is a prism? It is a refracting medium. It has two plane surfaces inclined at an angle. Greater the angle, the stronger the prismatic effect. So the prism produces displacement of objects seen through, seen through it towards the apex, away from the base. Okay. Shall we look at the next question guys? Okay. Easy one only we'll see. Keratometry is useful in measuring. What will you measure? Uh, with keratometry, what will you measure? Will you measure corneal curvature, corneal thickness, conical diameter, depth of anterior chamber? It could be one of these two, something to do with the cornea. So come on, is it the corneal curvature or the corneal thickness? So there is another term, pachymetry, right? So what do you think that one is? That is the thickness. So the answer here should be corneal curvature, right? Let's look at the answer. Yes, corneal curvature. So a keratometer is also called as an ophthalmometer. You will measure the curvature of the anterior surface of the cornea. So what and all will you know? You will know the radial curvature of the cornea, the degree of the corneal astigmatism, the direction of the principal meridians of the eye determining whether the astigmatism is with the rule or against the rule. Okay. So basically for fitting the lens, right? So this is a key factor. If there is any corneal distortion also, you can know. So basically, you are measuring the corneal curvature. So normal, it will be 45 diopter. Okay. So basically, this is normal cornea. If it is very much like this, then it is called as keratoconus. Very conical. If it is, it will be keratoconus. They mentioned that here as conical. Okay. But here, what are we using keratometry for? We are using it for corneal curvature. Okay. So just remember that corneal thickness is used with pachymetry. So is this clear? So shall we move on to the next question guys? Okay, good. So gonioscopy is used to study. Gonioscopy is used to study what? Is it used to study the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, angle of anterior chamber, retina? Here there are in two options they have given anterior chamber, anterior chamber. So, could be more about anterior chamber. What do you think? So, what are you using uh, to study? What are you studying in gonioscopy? The angle, right? Because you want to check whether there is drainage of the aqueous humor. So, this is the answer. Gonioscopy is used to study angle of anterior chamber. So, here you can see. So, here is the anterior chamber in front of the iris. It has the aqueous humor. So with the gonioscopy, they're going to measure, they're going to check the angle of the anterior chamber, right? To check for the drainage of the aqueous humor in conditions of glaucoma. Shall we move to the next question? Great. What do you think tonography is? Tonography helps you to determine, look at the options here, the rate of formation of aqueous, outflow of aqueous, intraocular pressure, None of the above. So what is tonography? Basically it is again something in glaucoma. Okay. So basically the outflow of the aqueous. One of the options you can have. Intraocular pressure. Okay. Basically according to the textbook it is a non-invasive technique for, for determining, determining the facility of aqueous outflow. C value. Okay. So we will go with this. So this is going to become the answer. Okay, so the answer here is facility of outflow of aqueous. So let's look at the answer here. Correct answer is B or 2. 
Tonography helps you to determine its non-invasive way of finding out the facility of outflow of the aqueous humor. So you have different types of instruments here. Looks like it is a shy odds tonometer. Look at the spelling here. Sky odds tonometer. And what about this one? This one is a planation tonometry. Okay. So let's move on to the next MCQ. So shall we look at the next MCQ guys? Let's take something again easy only. Don't worry. Which type of tonometer is best for measuring intraocular? What is T? Intraocular tension. Let's look at the answer directly here. So the options here are sky zyot tonometer. If you see in this IOT word is there. A planation tonometer, pulse air tonometer, indentation tonometer. Let's look at the answer. Answer is to a planation tonometer. Okay. So this is the answer. So they are asking the best, okay, the which type of tonometer is best for measuring IOT. The answer is a planation tonometer. So guys, this one is a planation tonometry. Basically, there are many types of uh, the tonometers available in this, in this planation itself. Like you have Goldman tonometer, then you have uh, Perkins planation tonometer, pneumatic tonometer, pulse air tonometer, tono pen etc. So this is the best to measure the intraocular pressure. Didn't, uh, didn't they say that this pulse air tonometer is a type of this aplanation only? Interesting. So anyways the concept of this aplanation tonometer is that uh, whenever you have a sphere right and there is pressure inside that sphere. So uh, that pressure whatever is there inside that sphere and whatever force you need to flatten this surface of the sphere, okay? So these will be proportional. So listen again. The pressure inside a sphere is equal to the force required to flatten its surface divided by the area of flattening. So that is like P is equal to W by A. The pressure inside is equal to W by A. W they are representing as the force force required to flatten divided by the flattening area. Okay, so this is the planation tonometer. That is the principle. Basically in this uh, Goldman tonometer etc. there will be these prisms. Whatever prisms you have learnt, right? You will use that in a lot of instruments. Good guys. So shall we take a few more MCQs? Okay. A real easy one for you. Perimetry is a test to assess the options are visual acuity Visual acuity, acuity is like reading those letters, right? Intraocular pressure, not at all. So this one is not at all the answer, I'm sure. Visual field, depth of anterior chamber. Why perimetry for depth of anterior chamber? We have finished perimetry in physiology. That time, what did we see? Okay, so the answer is visual field, right? Remember, visual acuity means uh, you will read that chart, right? What is the chart called? Snellen's chart, remember? Snellen's chart. So this is visual acuity. Here we are not talking about visual acuity. We are talking about what perimetry is used for. Perimetry is used for visual field. So that is the answer for you, visual field. Let us look at the answer here. Yes, answer is 3, visual field. So what is this perimetry? So remember this chart. Perimetry chart, remember? And do you remember the instrument, this one, right, in your physiology lab? Moving on to another very easy question. Refractive condition of the eye at birth is, so at birth, the eye is hypermetropia. This much we know. So now let us narrow down. So here at birth, a newborn will have hypermetropia. It can see things which are far, but it will not be able to see things which are close by. Interesting. So hypermetropia of how many diopters? The answer here is one, two diopters. Okay. So that is the answer. So this one, hypermetropia of two diopters is the answer at birth. At birth, the refractive condition of the eye will be hypermetropia of two diopters. This can be up to some plus three also you can say. Okay. It can be plus three also. Plus 2 to plus 3 
diopters. So, basically in hypermetropia, what will happen? The image will form behind the retina. So, if the rays are coming from far, it is focusing perfectly. But if it's coming from near, it is focusing behind the retina. Right? It's converging behind the retina. So, this is hypermetropic eye. Okay? Let's just look at another three questions. Okay, guys? Don't worry. Amsler grid is used in options are detecting maculopathy, optic disc examination, squint, retinal examination. It's a grid. So, how will a grid be? Something like this. Right? So, that will be a grid. So, where do you think it will be used? Some, not this definitely. Not squint. Could be something here. Amsler grid. So, here is Amsler's grid. So, basically it is, um, this Amsler grid is used regularly by the patients. Okay. It is going to be used by the patients. So, they can detect if there is any new or progressive metamorphopsia. So, then they will seek ophthalmic advice. So, which part of the retina or we are talking about here? So, it is the macula. So, basically you are going to detect maculopathy with the Amsler's grid. So, that is the answer here. Okay, Amsler grid is used in detecting maculopathy. Here you can see the macula, this area, right, is the macula. In the center of it you have the fovea, right. So, it is a specific portion of your retina. Don't get confused when we say macula, don't get confused with the uh, ear. Okay, in ear also you have macula, right, in the utricle and the saccule, not that macula, okay. So, Amsler grid is used in detecting maculopathy. Now, next question, colored halos are seen in all except. So, this is an except question. So, the first except question we are looking at in this video, an except question. So, three of the options are correct where you will see colored halos. Actually, we should say halos, okay. Colored halos are seen in all except, okay. So, the answer here is corneal opacity. We will see colored halos in cataract, angle closure, glaucoma and corneal edema. So, actually there are a lot of causes for colored halos. So, this is something that the patient sees guys. So, the patient sees the colored halo. So, they are, they are around the light, they will see colored halo. So, wherein all will it happen in glaucoma, in corneal edema, in cataract and conjunctivitis. This four you remember, okay. So, here you will say cataract, glaucoma, corneal edema. Did they mention corneal edema here? Yeah, corneal edema. Example, bullous keratopathy. So, in all these, the patient will perceive colored halos around the light. Remember, this is a feature that the patient sees. You are not going to examine and find this, okay? So, let's just take one last question. I am just seeing which question will be easy. Okay, look at this one. See if it is easy. Painful loss of vision is seen in. So, where will you see painful loss of vision? So, this is a bad thing, right? Painful for the patient. But yes, it could be a easy to cure condition. Painful loss of vision. Cataract? No, they don't feel any pain. Glaucoma? Open angle one. Doesn't seem to be painful. Angle closure? Yes. Anterior uveitis? Uveitis is painful, I have heard. So, answer will be C and D. What do you think? So, answer could be C and D. Let's see the answer. Yes. Answer is C and D. That is 2. Okay. So, painful will be angle closure glaucoma. Suddenly, there will be increase in the intraocular pressure. Uveitis, inflammation of the ciliary body. Iris, choroid, right? But this is anterior uveitis. So, here what and all will be inflamed? So, here it is called as iridocyclitis. You can say basically here what and all will be inflamed? The iris, pars plicata of ciliary body, right? So, this will be anterior uveitis, a very painful condition. So, painful loss of vision, you will see an angle closure glaucoma, anterior uveitis, okay? That's all now, guys. I think uh, a few MCQs we have looked at. Hopefully, you have learned something. Bye-bye.